Thank you all very much for coming. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I was asked to tell you a story in 20 minutes. Um, being an academic as well as a novelist, I'm going to tell it, but then I'm kind of going to undo it at the end. And being an academic as well as a novelist, I decided to give you a kind of whistle-stop tour of European history at the beginning of my 20 minutes, not being remotely ambitious. <laughs> so, once upon a time, in the olden days of Europe, when the sun still went round the earth, America was only a rumour, and Australia did not yet exist. There were no doctors, because the profession of medicine did not exist either. The reasons why doctors and Australia came into being at the same time are a slightly different story. Indeed, the story of my PhD, but I won't tell you that now. <laughs> but people still fell ill and hurt themselves in the olden days. And they were still afraid of pain and death, and they still wanted to live forever. So their communities were able to sustain healers. People with specialist knowledge about the workings of the human body and the properties of the plants that could be used for cure. There was no distinction between caring and healing, and the really important bit, there was no decision between pharmacy and cooking. Really like that one. All foods were thought to heal some things and harm others, and pretty much all medicine was something that you ate. And therefore, healing fell within women's domain. It was a natural extension of the work of the kitchen and the bedroom that was always done by women. Don't worry, I'm going to unpack this later. So healing belonged to women, and particularly to the wealthy women who had the means and the resources to grow the stuff, to harvest it, to learn how it worked. The religious orders were still the powerhouses of health, education, welfare, art, scholarship at this date, and therefore many of the expert healers were nuns, although some of them were ladies of the manor. They could set bones, alleviate some pains, cure some troubles of the digestion and skin. Many were literate, and some of their books survive. This is where we start free-falling through history, right? We've got the olden days. In a minute, we're going to have the modern days. Then came the Reformation, with it the fall of the great religious orders in England. Then came industrialization and urbanization, ignore the intervening 300 years. And with them, the fracturing of the old arrangements for social security, health care, and the feeding and housing of the very poor. Health care was no longer included in the social contract, or the give and take of community life, and became a service to be paid for. Once money gets involved, women start to be shuffled out. Funny that. At the same time, developments in science, fueled partly by the aftershocks of the Reformation and partly by the technological developments of industrialization, expanded and formalized ideas about anatomy and physiology. Modern medicine, in other ways, began to take shape, and the men moved in. Many women didn't like the disappearance of female healers. Working class women couldn't afford the fees charged by professional doctors. Very few women were comfortable exposing their bodies to the male gaze, and in many cases postponed seeking advice until the point of death for fear of such exposure. That wasn't wholly unreasonable anyway in an era when actually there was little most doctors could do to postpone most of the ways of dying. Doctors were said to exploit poor women for experiments and practice, and to coax wealthy women into believing themselves sick in order to generate more lucrative work. Medicine was masculine, white, and privileged, and doctors were said to be more interested in using their new surgical implements and trying out new drugs than listening to women. Again, I promise I'll undo this later. By now, in the 1860s, we're into the era of the Contagious Diseases Act. The Contagious Diseases Act came about because the British Army was thought to be disabled by syphilis. And the solution to that is obviously to arrest any women on the streets, force them into police stations and check if they're carrying sexually transmitted disease, because it's all women's fault. So the Contagious Diseases Act stated that any woman suspected of being a prostitute could be detained by the police against her will and forcibly subjected to an internal examination in a police station to determine whether she had syphilis. The motivation for this was to reduce the rates of infection in the armed forces, where it was beginning to interfere with the defense of the nation, or at least with the expansion of empire, which in the 1860s was approximately the same thing. You could be suspected of being a prostitute if you were out in the evening without your husband, even if you were coming home from work or had gone out to buy something for the children's tea. So the image here, and it was an image in the popular press as well as in some of the slightly shoutier 1970s feminist histories, 
was women powerless, strapped down by abusive doctors, working in league with male police and male politicians to open women's bodies and peer inside. That's a kind of rhetorical strand. So many women, conservative, modest, ordinary women, wanted female doctors. And naturally, a few women, radical, confident, privileged women, wanted to be doctors. I think this is hugely important. This is why women become doctors decades before they become lawyers or civil servants or academics. It's because there's pressure from the radical and conservative ends. The mass of conservative women want there to be female doctors and a few radical women want to be female doctors. You don't have the same pressure on the legal professional academia. There it's just highly educated middle class women who want some interesting work. And that doesn't exert the same pincer movement on the professions as you get with medicine. So for a woman to become a doctor was an extraordinarily hard thing to do. By the late 1860s, the Society of Apothecaries had closed a loophole that had allowed one woman, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, to qualify. It's important that she got in through a loophole. They just failed to set things up in a way that categorically excluded women. So she crept in. But as soon as she had crept in, they closed the loophole to make sure there weren't any more. Medical education was firmly in the hands of the universities, none of which admitted women. Most cities in Britain had or were forming ladies' educational associations. These were intended to give middle-class women limited access to university lectures and teaching. And as far as I can see, nobody had a huge problem with that. The problem was with women graduating. It was okay to learn stuff and it was okay to be interested, but it wasn't okay to have a professional qualification because that meant you might go out and get a job with it. And that's you know, the really dangerous bit. You might earn some money. Since these associations constituted a network of educated and leisured feminists and sympathetic professors, both genders there, certainly among the feminists, they were the best wedge for opening medical education to women. I want to remember two men at this point, David Masson, professor of English at Edinburgh, and Sir James Simpson, professor of surgery at Edinburgh, who fought a long and bitter battle with their colleagues to allow women to matriculate. The matriculation is important. This was an argument about whether women could start at university. It wasn't an argument about whether they were allowed to take degrees. So the big fuss at this point is about whether women can join in with people taking degrees. It's not about whether they can actually pass the exams and get a degree, which turned out to be important later on. The initial objection to women joining medical training was that men and women couldn't be taught together because, you know, rude things might happen. And it wasn't worth putting on special classes for one woman. This was Sophia Jex Blake. She was trying to be the first woman to go to Edinburgh. So she placed an advert in the Times calling for comrades. It's a good advert. There are all sorts of things advertised in the Times. There were first five and then seven people who answered her letter. And seven of them turned out to be enough because the university could no longer say that it wasn't worth running a class for one person. It was maybe worth running a class for seven people. They all excelled in the matriculation exams and begged or borrowed hundreds of pounds to pay for extra teaching to compensate for the classes they were not allowed to share with male students. At that point, recent Edinburgh graduates began to howl in outrage and in all of the papers because their degrees would be devalued by the admission of women. You know, if it's so easy a woman can do it, it can't be worth very much. Month after month, the Lancet argued that there were already too many doctors and not enough jobs and that women doctors would steal men's work. Also, it's not entirely compatible, that no sane or decent woman would wish to be a doctor, and therefore that those who did were insane and indecent. And also, that women's success in examinations meant they were trying to steal scholarships from men. And also, that women's small brains and reproductive cycles made them incapable of rational thought. Clearly, the large brains that produced this idea saw no incompatibility <laughs> between women's irrationality and their stealing of university scholarships. <laughs> the Edinburgh Seven were assaulted by mobs of students on their way into exams. Um, somebody introduced a sheep to an exam that the women were taking. I mean, actually kind of shooed a sheep through the streets of Edinburgh and into the exam room to distract the women who were not distracted, kept going, did very well. They were denied access to laboratories, lectures, hospital wards, and libraries. They were spattered with mud and worse. And finally, despite their high marks and top rankings in all of the final exams, they were not allowed to graduate. The Assembly of Edinburgh decided that although it was all right to let them in, it wasn't all right to let them out at the other end. So although they'd 
excelled in all the exams, no degrees for them. One gave up, I'm surprised it was only one. Three went and qualified in Paris, one in Dublin, two in Switzerland. And a few years later, they set up the London School of Medicine for Women, should be coming up any moment, which was run by and for women, although depending also on the expertise and sympathy of senior male physicians. I think that's an important thing to say. Women would not have been able to get into medicine at this point if there hadn't been male doctors who were supporting and encouraging them. So despite that very binary narrative that I just offered you, it's obviously more complicated than that. And then they lived happily ever after. <laughs> I'm going to undermine that a little bit now. As you may have noticed, in fact, as I pointed out repeatedly, the story I've just told you depends on some very straightforward binaries. Good women, bad men. Powerful men, vulnerable women. Women are patients, are poor, are weak. Men are doctors, are rich, are strong. The happy ending is, in fact, only the crossing over of a small number of women from the lower side of the binary to the upper side of the binary. A few women become doctors, become strong, become rich, and that's a happy ending because it suggests that we may be working with an abacus here. You know, we haven't got a spectrum, but you can move things from one side to the other, a small number of things. Let me complicate things. One of the first women to qualify in London, she became a surgeon, was Mary Charlieb, the wife of a barrister in Madras. She had three children whom she left in India with her husband, interestingly, for many years while she trained as a doctor. She had seen Indian women refuse all medical care rather than violate the rules of their society and said that she wanted to free them from the shackles of Hinduism and Islam as practiced in 19th century India and liberate them into the new world of British Enlightenment. Once qualified, she returned to India with the personal support of Queen Victoria, who interestingly didn't support women doctors in Britain but thought they were just fine in India. <laughs> what is the relationship here between science, feminism, and colonialism? Like any good lecturer, I'm not going to answer these questions, though you'll be pleased here, I'm not going to issue an assessment at the end. Some of the first women surgeons removed healthy ovaries from female patients suffering from hysteria at a time when the operation was already controversial and not incidentally carried a 45% chance of death. A couple of these female surgeons had significantly higher mortality rates than their male colleagues, but continued to operate on the grounds that women needed more practice and to prove that women could do it. Feminism is perhaps not always in this instance on the side of social justice. Sophia Jex Blake did not publicly oppose the Contagious Diseases Act, preferring, perhaps understandably, to fight one battle at a time. A woman, perhaps now as then, cannot succeed without becoming complicit with the patriarchy. Many of the women who campaigned for women's medical education were also working for the outlawing of vivisection. It was a huge movement in the late 19th century arguing that there were parallels between surgeons' treatment of women and surgeons' treatment of animals. The women as animals and animals as women trope is one that many contemporary feminists might see as a little bit problematic. This was also an argument that every feminist ought to be vegetarian because the same powers that were oppressing women were oppressing animals. I have slight difficulties with this analogy. The same women opposed vaccination seeing in all cases the violation of innocent bodies in the name of science, the forcible introduction of medical implements to the flinching body, seeing science, in fact, as the opposite of feminism. And of course, women couldn't have become doctors or done much else without the unstinting support of a few good men, who perhaps needed at least as much courage as the women they were supporting. So it's these complexities, it's these tripwires, it's these trapdoors in the historical record, which for me are where it becomes interesting to start writing fiction. It's not the straightforward stories, it's not the stories with the goodies on one side and the baddies on the other side that I'm interested in telling. It's about these moments of complicity and compromise. It's about the price that's paid for change. Radical social change never comes easily. It's not usually done by nice people. That was one of the things I really had to confront when I started writing this book. Women did not get the vote by being nice. And that also means that the women who did won, win the vote were not necessarily nice. I'm sure the Pankhursts were an absolute nightmare to live with. 
And a lot of my lovely pioneering female doctors were probably also not very nice because I don't see how you could do that if you were nice, if you were having things thrown at you as you went into your exams, if there was a baying mob waiting for you when you came out of your exams. They just made jokes about the sheep and kept on going. That strength of mind is something that we desperately need, but it's not, I think, ever something that's easy to live with. Thank you.